thank everybody for coming today. Uh, uh, we've called this meeting uh, the, what did we call this meeting? The, 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 the toolkit, the investor's toolkit. And uh, Gina was partly right when she said the toolkit was all mine. Uh, it, I actually don't own all of these things. This is sort of a collection of tools or a collection of documents and spreadsheets that I've gathered and in some cases presented on over the last eight years. A few of them I've authored, uh, most not, however, and I'll distinguish them when we get to it. One thing I determined uh, a number of days ago, though, when I had started assembling the documents for this presentation, is I found that I could not present it all in a single meeting. So I cut the presentation in half, and we're going to present half today and half later on. Here's the title screen. Um, so anyway, uh, we're going to get started now and talk about the Investor's Toolkit and I've collected, it's about 40 slides. Uh, and this is, this could be approached in several different ways. And the way we're gonna approach it today is I basically decided to do a, a sampling of each of these documents and, to, and uh, tools and Excel spreadsheets and, and whatnot. Let's go over the agenda real quick. The first item that I have is how to establish an asset allocation, how to test that asset allocation. I have several documents and spreadsheets that go along with each of these how to choose a mutual fund, how to create an investment plan. Some people call it an investment policy statement. How to use a spreadsheet to maintain your portfolio. I have a whole bunch of stuff on that. What we will not be able to get to today because, uh, well, there's not enough time. Uh, hopefully next month or the month after I'll finish this presentation uh, are the following. How to calculate your personal rate of return. Uh, how to evaluate two or more different portfolios using Portfolio Visualizer, how to reach financial independence uh, with a Mr. Money Mustache chart, how to construct a safe withdrawal rate and how the markets work. Okay, so uh, the first uh, tool that I'd like to talk about uh, will help you to establish an asset allocation. For those of you who have already established one, well, maybe you could tweak it. After reading some of this stuff, you might be interested in this. And this is based on a presentation from March of 2020 called A Practical Guide to Staying Afloat. And I'm just gonna excerpt all these so you're not gonna get the full enchilada. I'm gonna make the links available so you can dive into these. Now, some of these are rather modest in length, two or three or four pages, and some are full presentations that might go 20 pages. Uh, but I'm going to kind of guide you to the, the best stuff inside of it. Um, so the question is asked on one of these on, on the slide inside this presentation, how do you determine your asset allocation? And what I recommended in this presentation was to start with a target date retirement fund. It really doesn't matter which one, but as most of you know, the target date retirement funds have a, a usually a, a target date, a particular um, year that uh, they assume you're gonna be retiring. Now we've talked about this in the past and you, you may not wanna follow the recommendation. Uh, sometimes people wanna uh, set a, a particular glide path and they wanna be more in stocks and less in bonds than the target, uh, their, their actual target date. Uh, but in any event, this is a good starting place. So let's say you, you choose a starting date of uh, you know 10 years from now and your actual retirement date is say 15 or five, it could be different than that. And what I recommend here is to test your asset allocation after you've determined what's in the target date fund by reducing your stock portion by about half and ask yourself how you'd feel about living with the amount that remains for more than 10 years. Now, what I'm not suggesting here is you actually make any moves. This is, this is an exercise, this is on paper. So you test your asset allocation by using a tool that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. Uh, and that's how you can tell whether you've got the right asset allocation for yourself, uh, a good way to test it. Um, now you could use age and bonds and there's a number of other rules of thumb, uh, but I uh, mentioned here that generalized advice probably uh, doesn't apply to most people. Age and bonds, well, that sorta of, kinda of works. People say age and bonds minus 10, age and bonds minus 20. Um, when I was investing, I was it was very important that I have a high percentage of stocks. And so the agent bonds never made any sense to me. I'd fill out those questionnaires that the uh, uh, mutual fund providers would, would give you and they, they just didn't 
uh, didn't align with my own goals. They might with yours, but you have to make that determination. Uh, when is a good time to make asset allocation changes? Well, I can tell you when not to, and that's when the market goes up radically or goes down or it becomes very volatile for a while. Uh, now, most uh, most advisors would say, when you, at a certain point in your life, after a change, you have a baby, you get married, you move house, uh, uh, you're close to retirement, maybe that's a good time to make an asset allocation change. And I don't know how to reply to that other than to say that perhaps uh, maybe that works. Uh, but I think the best description of uh, the best encapsulation of, of that measurement of the assessment, assessment comes from Larry Swedrow. And on the third line there from the bottom, it says, when, you need, when your need, ability, and or willingness to take risk changes. And this is just one particular slide. I'll see if I'm successful going to the next one. Uh, okay. Uh, this is from a presentation uh, back in October 2020 called Investing in Index Funds. Uh, this is sort of a, a survey here. And on, on the screen is a, a typical or a possible portfolio uh, from Bill Schulteis called the Coffeehouse Portfolio. And yes, I'm aware there's multiple Coffeehouse portfolios. Uh, this is the one that was in the presentation. And this may help you to establish an asset allocation by looking at other people's portfolios. Uh, Rick Ferry has a, a sample portfolio, Bill Bernstein, and there's a BOGO head, three fund and four fund portfolios. All of those are outlined in the, in, the, in this particular uh, uh, presentation called Investing in Index Funds. And you may note that there is a URL, a, a link at the bottom of the screen there. Now, at the end of this presentation, I should say, uh, when I send out the uh, video links, uh, I will include all of the URLs and all the names for all of the documents that I'm going to share with you today, all of the tools. And continuing on with the, with the same vein, how to establish an AA, an asset allocation. Uh, this was a presentation from March of 21, March of 2021. And the reason this is, might be helpful is because there is a discussion of risk versus return, which is sort of an important relationship in, uh, in setting your asset allocation and selecting your investments. Again, this is just a, a, a excerpt. This is a little different. Now we're gonna move on to how to test your asset allocation. And I, I used to call this the crash meter when I first wrote this uh, close to 10 years ago now, I guess. Uh, but when I presented it to the our local chapters, Boglehead Group, uh, it, we ended up changing that name because nobody knew what crash meter meant. And uh, so we call it Crash Watch. And this is kind of a friendly, uh, it's an Excel spreadsheet with a sort of a friendly interface. And I, I'll just uh, see if I can expand this a bit. Yeah, we are. Uh, I'd like you to note that the last time it was updated was 2018, but it's still very much um, valid. Uh, I tried to make this as entertaining as I could. It's been through several iterations and I've received quite a bit of positive feedback on this. But what this will enable you to do is to determine if the percentage of stock you have in your portfolio uh, is right for you. And it does that because it's an exercise. You enter in a few variables and how much your stocks and how much your uh, total portfolio is. And then you take the trip. You, you test it with various uh, percentages that represent market drops. I suppose you could you could reverse it and put in negative amounts and find that you, uh, you know, for uh, a market increase as well, but it's mainly designed for market drops. So down here in this little, uh, I guess that's a box, um, says daily stock crashes started in New York on October 24, 29, and it goes on. Now, that's just an example. This is just the what's your appetite. Each one of the uh, stops and scheduling represents a different tab on the spreadsheet. This is the pre-flight tour, in other words, the introduction. Then there's preparing to crash, where you actually enter your information from your portfolio. Then there's the crash report, which is I call the survival drill, and then the debriefing, what, what you can learn from what you've done. And finally, safe trip and careful goodbyes if you can see that there. Okay, 
Uh, now, this is a continuation of that spreadsheet. I've just, I just basically took uh, screen, screen, uh, screenshots. Uh, there's the short history of the crash. And this is a, uh, let me make this a little larger, excuse me. Uh, I, I start with the, the crash of 1929 as an example, because it's the most dramatic one that I can think of. I mean, yes, if you're in Germany in World War II, uh, or Russia, or one of the many countries that were run over by Russia, first Germany and then Russia during the war. Yeah, you did, they didn't have stock markets. They, they just totally crashed. So if you had investments there, it would have failed utterly. But for United United States, uh, we've only been misfortuned by one Great Depression in our history, although there were prior depressions, but nothing is severe. And over a period of less than four years, the stock market dropped in value 89%. And this is just an example of what, what you can do with this tool. You enter a date, you enter the amount of stocks in dollars, which you have in your portfolio and your total portfolio amount, and then you enter in the number. And here's here is the sheet, it's a, it's a single tab where you enter this information. And yes, there are instructions. A few people asked for those after after I had initially distributed it. So this is, well, I guess I call it idiot proof. Uh, even if you don't know anything about spreadsheets, you can figure this out because I have lots of examples here. And it, it's a fairly short uh, abbreviated spreadsheet. You enter in the date, usually today's date, or whenever you uh, uh, document what how much your total portfolio is. You enter the total amount of your stocks here in step two. And there's instructions there to be real specific. It includes any stock portion of your balanced or target date funds. Step three is the total portfolio. And I indicate here, and see if I can make this large here, uh, what to include and what not to include. Basically include almost everything, uh, anything that's considered an invested asset. The exceptions could be, uh, oh, if you have a 529 plan that you don't consider part of your portfolio, that it's that you consider that um, for your for your kid, for example, or your grandkid, uh, you probably wouldn't include that because they don't consider that your money. Any earmarked funds, the home you live in, that doesn't belong in the total value of your portfolio. But uh, rental real estate certainly would, uh, loans, uh, certificates of deposits, any brokerage account or retirement account. Uh, this is the uh, the example that I talked about earlier. The uh, for the uh, the Great Depression that we had, the, the four years where the stock market was just going down, down, down. And this this should serve as a good example of, of what you can do. If the stocks decline by 89%, you've entered the information already in the prior page. So we start off with a portfolio of 1.5 million. And you'll notice down here that it provides an asset allocation that um, tells you you're 75% in stocks, 25% in bonds. Now, it, it runs this calculation based on the number that you provide. What if stocks decline by whatever? You could do 1%, 5%, 100%. <laughs> well, I think the, it's obvious how much it would be. The advantage to doing this is that you get to see the dollar figures of your portfolio, which is why it might be worth a few minutes for you to actually take time and take your actual portfolio numbers, the dollar amounts, and enter them. And for this particular portfolio, 1.5 million, which was a um, a minor fortune back uh, in 1929. It started off at a 75% stock allocation. And at the end of those almost four years, uh, the stock was uh, valued at 123,000 instead of a million, a million plus. The bonds uh, remained at 375,000. That may not be realistic. If you're in treasuries, it probably earned some money uh, for those four years. Uh, but the, the total portfolio, the post-crash value is what I call it here, was 25% stocks, 75% bonds. In other words, it inverted your asset allocation. Now, would this make you feel good to know you've lost two thirds of your money? Well, just think about all those folks who didn't believe in the government and decided not to uh, invest anything in bonds. So this may be helpful for, I think I've got one more on here. I'm gonna try to find it. No, I don't. Uh, so let me let me go back one page here. Just this is the main data sheet that you enter this stuff in. It's called Crash Watch, and this is one of the tools that are is available, and it should it should be pretty helpful. 
Uh, here's another tool. And this one is under the category of how to choose a mutual fund. And at first I, I didn't remember that we had ever presented on this, but then uh, I found a presentation that we gave in March of 2018. And uh, we do indeed have a uh, fund selection criteria, which was a, a very short presentation that we gave. And it talked about which criteria would you select when you're picking an ETF or a fund. And uh, later on, it talks about specific funds from specific providers, Fidelity and T. Rowe Price and, and whatnot, and how you can uh, uh, construct a three or four fund Bogleheads type portfolio uh, and which funds to, to use. The most important part though, is to know how you're picking those funds. And here, the number one criteria is low cost. I'm not gonna read all of this stuff. Uh, I've only accepted a couple of pages. Uh, obviously, low cost is the best. Uh, well, maybe not obvious, but uh, Morningstar used to give out these uh, like gold star and silver star. I think they do for their for their funds uh, to, to give a little bit of help to people who don't know which funds to pick. But even Morningstar has come around. And a few years ago, they basically said that low cost was the best um, uh, indicator of, of getting superior returns in the future. So, you know, because of that quandary that we have in investing that if you're, if a particular fund or a stock for that matter, but particularly a, a fund is earns, is at very high price right now and has done quite well with high returns, the expected returns are actually lower. So that the low cost is a better indicator because of that. Just because the uh, fund was gold star for the last five years, uh, that could mean the next five years will stink. Uh, then it talks about the expense ratio, keep the cost low. Uh, this was done about five years ago, and 0.35%, which is 35 basis points, does not look very good now. Um, that looks like the uh, size of an AUM uh, fee. But uh, I would say this is probably probably should be 20.20, because fi in five years, the expense ratios have come down considerably, and not just at Vanguard, but at all the big players. Uh, turnover should be for a, a broad market stock market fund should be less than 10% per annum. That still applies. It will be higher for bond funds because they uh, generally have more turnover on a normal basis. But for a total stock market or an S&P fund, you don't want that to be a high number because um, if your advisor or provider is, you know, the, uh, the fund, funds advisor, if they're churning through uh, new purchases, you have to ask yourself why, because the market is just not that volatile as far as overturn. Uh, a few years ago, we added Tesla, and there's been other uh, ads to the S&P 500, but uh, that, that the 10% pretty much accounts for all that. So if you encounter a fund that you're considering purchase, and the turnover is like 125% or 200%, that you almost always means an active fund, you ought to ask yourself whether that's worthwhile because the fund is generating a lot of, a lot of internal costs, and someone's got to pay those costs, and it may, it may come out of those returns. Uh, then this is less of an issue now, but I understand there are still uh, funds that are do, doing loads, front end loads, back end loads. Uh, even Vanguard is a couple of those types of funds. But uh, if you don't have to pay a load fee. Uh, don't pay it, and certainly don't pay advertising, which is the 121B. And seek out and try to obtain cheap funds as far as administration. Uh, years ago, when I was with Vanguard, I had to pay, I don't know whether it was, I can't remember whether it was 10 or 20 percent uh, per, I'm going to say per year, but it may have been per quarter, uh, for each account that I had. And that was just sort of a maintenance fee. And then later I learned that I could just elect to get everything by email and that they would remove that fee, which is what I did. And now uh, don't pay anything to Vanguard, have it in many, many years. So if you can get low or no fees, that's the ideal. Uh, and this is part of that same uh, presentation. Fund selection criteria number two, is this fund right for you? Uh, what is your investment policy statement or investing plan? Uh, make sure that the fund is a good fit for your portfolio. Uh, and that means uh, what's the impact on your asset allocation? What are the risk and return attributes? 
Um, and are you able to rebalance into or out of this fund with little or no tax repercussion? And finally, and I think this is the most important, if you uh, uh, align with the Bogleheads, that is, do you see yourself invested in this particular fund or ETF forever, or at least 10 or 15 years? If you're uh, of the mind that you're going to keep something for a year and get rich quick, um, I'm afraid this is not the meeting or the presentation for you. Uh, because I, I can't help you to get rich quick, uh, but we know how to get rich slow. That's a given. And uh, this is a from another uh, another uh, presentation that was given by Chris Peterson last fall in October of 22. We called it Simple and Effective Balanced Lifetime Portfolios. And what I liked about his presentation was he has a lot of these uh, kind of uh, homey uh, metaphors, including what's in the typical investor's pantry, where he he uh, shares his asset classes uh, pre, uh, before a discussion of those, and he's got them mixed up into uh, categories, staple ingredients and spices, mild and strong. I don't think I would have ever had the imagination to come up with that. And there are some other good and interesting things. He provides sample portfolios. Now, what Chris found, or what the Merriman Financial Education Foundation found, um, and they believe that the research that they've done supports this, is that you can just take a target date fund, or a life strategy fund, I suppose, and you can just add a little bit of, say, small value or another. You can tilt it just slightly. And if you're willing to keep with that tilt for many decades, that you have a high probability of earning a little bit more in your um, portfolio. Now, whether that's of value to you depends a little bit on how much you value the having that extra half a percent or whatever it is you might earn over all those years. And also, you have to look at the risk uh, uh, profile of that portfolio. If you tilt too much toward risky investments, uh, that, that could mean that you're going to underperform greatly the uh, broad market or the S&P 500. So that's something to think about, or I should say the world market as well, if you own a world fund. Uh, but he has lots of good information there, and I provided a link. All of these things can be downloaded. Now, th this one, uh, I say how to choose a mutual fund. In this case, how to choose a bond fund or how to choose a bond. Uh, this is a uh, something I call bond formulas, and this was developed, I think, initially about 2016, 2017. Um, I've included this is the this is another uh, Excel spreadsheet that has gone through numerous iterations uh, based on feedback we received from members. So uh, at this point, I've I've left it alone for a few years, and there's nothing really outdated except for the tax brackets. Uh, but you can change the tax brackets in here. It's really obvious how to do that. So we're looking for tax equivalent yield, and this uh, will have no meaning to you if uh, and, and won't be necessary if you are in a very low tax bracket, 10, 12, whatever, 15%. If you're in one of the middling tax brackets, or if you have income that changes from year to year, um, say it goes up and down by $100,000 or more, uh, this may be a concern if you're, in the, if you're in the situation where you need to buy some bonds and taxable, uh, because this will give you the taxable equivalent yield. And I include uh, introduction, and uh, answers the question, should I invest in tax exempt funds or municipal bonds or their taxable equivalents? Uh, so that's really the question is tax exempt versus taxable in a taxable account. And uh, here's the uh, very rather simple uh, entry form that you use to do this. And you enter in three different items here. And I, as I said before, you can change the tax table down here. Uh, for whenever these percentages change, just make sure you you choose the one that's right for you and the, put the tax bracket code under this column here. Uh, then you enter in the tax exempt bond that you want to look at or the taxable bond. And I could say it could be bond or bond uh, bond fund. In the example that I use, the tax exempt fund is called Vanguard Intermediate Tax Exempt. And you notice that uh, the fund, I've got the fund code here and the yield. Yeah, that's the SEC yield, uh, then the duration is the same. And then I compare it to the inter intermediate term bond index fund. The duration is the same. The expense ratio is slightly different. Uh, I don't think that's a typo. 
And the SEC, the 30 day yield is definitely different. You enter that information. Uh, basically, this is, uh, has a very simple function. It displays your tax equivalent yield and puts a check mark in the column, which one you should consider purchase based on that and uh, makes the suggestion here, buy the taxable bond fund in this case. And uh, if you have sharp eyes or you've seen this before, you will have noted that I may have done a typo because the intermediate term bond, in other words, the taxable bond, the yield is 2.53% according to the top example, and yet I, I entered in uh, 243. Now, I don't know if I made a typo there or it had changed while I was doing this. I'm not really sure, but you can, you can work that out, I think. Uh, then the last sheet of this particular uh, bond formula Excel spreadsheet uh, is just a simple value calculator using uh, face value, coupon rate, market interest. Uh, um, some people might find this helpful, so that's included. Okay. There we are. Uh, the next thing that we're going to talk about, next tool, is how to create uh, an investment plan. Some people call it an investment policy statement or IPS. Now, this is something that I know we have a number of members who are very resistant to this for some reason, or they tell you that their investing plan is in their head. You know, it, you have to do what's right for you. Uh, there are some advantages of writing it down, and there are some very simplistic uh, documents that I've seen that talk about how to create an investment plan uh, or IPS. And then there are some that are endlessly complex, and I and I and they just uh, kind of blow your mind for how difficult it is to get through it. This is a nice middle ground. I think uh, Christine Benz, who wrote this article. Uh, did a superb job. She has six steps, which I'll, I'll go over quickly. And each one of these steps has about one paragraph uh, devoted to it. The entire article is less than two pages, and it's a good read. She's a good writer. Uh, the first is document your goals, outline your investment strategy, then document what your current investments are, uh, what decide what your asset allocation is or should be, then outline what investment a selection criteria. Uh, and finally, how are you going to monitor the portfolio? And along with this, there is a simple two-page Morningstar spreadsheet for investment, creating an investment policy statement. And so you can see that it, this is pretty, sorry here, I'm trying to expand a little bit. <laughs> uh, I give up. Um, under executive summary on the left, uh, some of the questions that are asked are, what are the current assets on my portfolio today? You should be able to have a good idea to look at your accounts and tally them up. How much do you plan to invest each month? How many years will you be investing? Now, this is kind of tilted toward accumulators, but anyone can use this, even a retired uh, individual. How much do I expect my return, a portfolio to return each year over inflation? Uh, that's a pretty good number, and there are instructions that tell you a little bit about this, how to how to put that number in. Uh, I can tell you the first time I did something like this, I uh, I was very optimistic, and this is not an area on your IPS where you wish you should probably be very optimistic. I think at the time I considered two percent inflation, even though the average is close to four over time, uh, two percent inflation because it happened to be two percent inflation the year that I was doing this. And I uh, anticipated going forward a minimum of 10% per year. And this was at a time where we weren't even doing 10% a year. I was a new investor at the time. So I, when I extrapolated, I decided that I could retire in four years and I'd be a multi-billionaire in about 12 years. Uh, I even have the spreadsheet to show that it was like the, the, the old saw about the checkerboard and starting off with one item in the first square and two items in the second square. Well, I had an exponential accumulation of wealth that was not terribly realistic. Uh, so that's a good exercise just to show you um, uh, how long it would take you to earn a certain amount of money, but don't use that very, very high uh, uh, figure for, for that percentage. You will uh, regret it. So uh, other questions that are asked here, how much do I expect my portfolio to return each year over inflation? 
how much of a loss can I accept over, you know, three, three month, one year, five year, what your target asset allocation is that, that should be decided prior to this. Uh, what are the benchmarks for your portfolio? A lot of people forget this. Uh, a good benchmark is perhaps an S&P 500 index. Uh, uh, if you want to use the world index, they've got uh, MSCI has indexes as well as a number of other companies. Uh, you can just Google them and come up with the index. Uh, don't pick anything too unrealistic. You want it to reflect your portfolio to the extent that it, it, it can. So you have realistic um, output. Uh, then there's investment projected. What is my financial goal? How will, how long will I need to be funding this goal? It could be college or it could be retirement or whatever. Uh, how much would this goal cost every year? Okay, now I can't shrink it again. Uh, all right, hold on. What's important to me as an investor gets into the, the hold on, exercise. There we go. And then this is the second part of that IPS spreadsheet. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, not spreadsheet, but document. What's What's my philosophy about taxes? That's an interesting one. I had to think about that a little bit. Uh, what are the investment selection criteria for your mutual fund? Of course, if you use the tool that we talked about a few minutes ago, the uh, selection criteria, you can establish that and document that. And this in total, answering all these questions will help you get a, the big picture. And I think I, I found it rather helpful. And some of mine is in my head, but most of it is written down. And um, I was able to accomplish most of that within a few years, mainly because I didn't I didn't uh, depart from my plan. I, I decided that I was going to stick with it and, and try to make that happen. And I was successful uh, to that extent. Now, here we end up with um, our final uh, category here that we're going to talk about today is how to use a spreadsheet to maintain your portfolio. And to do that, I've got, assembled two documents and three spreadsheets. Uh, and I'm not going to dig into any one of them. These are just samples. These are just excerpts. These are tools you can use. The first one is a two-page excerpt from a Bogleheads wiki article called How to Use a Spreadsheet to Maintain Your Portfolio. And we'll look at that first. And then uh, there's a, uh, a presentation that was given last March uh, by Jerome Moisand, uh, formerly of Boston, now somewhere in New York State, where he talks about rebalancing. And he has some good information there. Um, next, we turn to a, uh, a present, uh, not really a presentation, but a, a handout that we provided in 2016 to um, one of our meetings. I think there were probably 15 people or fewer at that meeting, so I don't uh, run any risk. I don't, I don't think most of you would be familiar with it. Uh, and here, uh, I'll talk about it in a second, but it basically combines three different approaches to rebalancing. The next is a spreadsheet that I call SABH Invest 2018. This is the public form of the spreadsheet that I wrote more than 15 years ago. And this particular version is just the sanitized, simplified version of that that I released in 2018. Uh, haven't got a whole lot of feedback on that, so I don't know whether people will find it helpful or not. Uh, so the, there's there kind of is an increasing order, uh, increasing complexity as you go down the list here. And the final one is a more of a general uh, financial planner, and it's called the Model Financial Plan. And this was authored by one of our members and presented a couple of times. The last time was in 2018. And uh, this might be helpful if you're looking for an, uh, kind of a, the Swiss pocket knife approach to uh, investment planning. So let's go. The first one is basically our two-page excerpt uh, listed right from the Bogleheads wiki. I presume they still have this article. I thought it was very good. I will see if I can expand just a little bit. Um, so this article talks about the best ways to set up. And notice how simple this is. Uh, this is not like a, 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 most of the spreadsheets you may have run into. Very simple. Which account? What type of asset class? That's domestic stocks, REITs, international stocks, and bonds. You could add more, obviously. And then there are the totals. And then the, there's the totals here on this uh, row that I'm pointing to. That Below that, it says desired, what it should be. And then the differences there. This, is, this should be made easier for you to calculate and to do your rebalancing. 
Uh, and the sample spreadsheet that is referenced here is actually written by a, um, uh, a Bogle Center board member. His name is David Grabner. Uh, I believe he's also a principal in the Washington, D.C. Bogleheads group, the local chapter. Um, now here, he has, there's, a, there's a URL that I include here in this. This is as a comment. And I'm only going to go through this, this one page here. It's just It's two pages. It's a quick read, about five minutes. And it may answer some questions that that are not answered at other. Uh, all right, I'm going to try to. There we go. It may answer some questions that are that you might not find or have a difficulty in finding in a more complex uh, document or spreadsheet. And um, another way is uh, using the uh, rebalancing um, presentation that Jerome. Uh, provided uh, back in, I think it was March of 2022. And I, I just happened to like this particular sample spreadsheet that he uh, included in that presentation because he, he adds these comments. He tells you what the field, the cell numbers are, and he tells you what it does and which you should enter in and which you shouldn't. Now, this is rather simple, you'll note. There's only a few funds here. There's only a few account types. You may have more account types. But the beauty of this is you can take this, and if you like the design, you can just adapt this by adding lines, uh, rows and columns, and make it your own. So you have a, a spreadsheet, a very simple spreadsheet that uh, you can utilize. Okay. Uh, and finally, uh, or next to finally, I guess, uh, uh, we have the CAM spreadsheet, which I say included three different approaches to rebalancing. And so there's there's Vanguard's best practices, which I summarize in the document. There's the cascade allocation method. And then there's the optimal lazy rebalancing. Optimal lazy, but not trivial. That's why there's this uh, online spreadsheet to help you get through it. Uh, the first one is was either created or adapted by uh, Harry Sitt, the finance buff, some years ago, uh, I think in 2007. And this is a way to, to determine your asset allocation. And he starts off with 100% portfolio, uses the top-down method or what he calls cascading. Uh, this may be an industry term. I don't remember if I read it outside. I would imagine that probably somebody else uh, wrote it and he and he adapted it or adopted it. The next decision that's made when you have a portfolio and you're seeking to establish an asset allocation is to make your stock bond split. So in this case, he's looking for a 60-40 portfolio, 60% bonds, I mean, 60% stocks and 40% bonds. Uh, the next level down would be uh, how much in US stocks versus international. And you'll notice that he has 42%, 18% international. You could stop there, but he goes down a few more levels. Now, I'd like you to notice that on every level, it all adds up to 100%. Stocks and bonds together, 100%. US stocks, international stocks, nominal bonds, tips uh, that he has here add up to 100%. Every, every single time you do an iteration in this top-down cascading, uh, the, the figures must all always sum to 100%. Uh, then he goes further, and I'll just use the example in the center, international stocks at 18%. He breaks that up into developed and emerging markets, 14% for developed, 4%. He further breaks up the developed and um, having a value percentage, 5%, developed market, 5%. That's the regular, I think that's his default. And the internet, he has a little bit of international small. So four plus five plus five is 14%. You add the 4%. That's 18% international stocks added with everything on this line. For, I mean, uh, the US stocks international is 60%. So it could be important, that particularly if you'd like to get into the rather detailed level, you wanna really drill down. You can go smar smaller than he's gone here. You can take your international small and divide that up into international small value and international blend or growth. Uh, likewise with emerging, there, I've heard of even uh, uh, funds that are that are ETFs that cover uh, foreign emerging small value with factors, other factors. Now that may be beyond what you'd want to do, but uh, in any event, this is a, a direct way to do this. 
And there is some, the difference between just seeing this on a, on a website somewhere is actually we provide steps, how to accomplish this. Step two would be define their stock bond split. Step three, which is the, where the arrow, red arrow was pointed, break out those stocks and then the bonds. And then there's some uh, instructions at the bottom. Level two is more important than level three, three over four and so forth. And it recommends that you stop when no additional levels are meaningful to you. So if you have a, um, a target date fund and that's all your money is in your target date fund or in your life strategy fund, you're done. You don't need this. Uh, but if you have uh, various funds and ETFs that cover different asset classes, this can be quite helpful. Uh, it helps with rebalancing, as it mentions, withdrawing and contributing. Okay, how to use your spreadsheet. This is a, this is part of the same document uh, that I uh, that we talked about earlier, um, and this is a, a, a expression of the optimal lazy rebalancing calculator, and this is authored by someone named Albert Mao. Uh, who is known on the forum as the one smiley. He wrote this back in 2013. And as far as I know, uh, at least I haven't had any contact with him uh, on the forum or elsewhere, but you can still find this calculator out on the internet. And it's, it's a great calculator. It takes uh, your contribution amounts or withdrawal amounts and your it breaks it out. You can decide what you want your allocation to be and what do you do with this extra contribution or withdrawal and then it tells you exactly how many dollars or how many shares should go uh, uh, to these to these funds or or taken from the funds. So I'll read the the bottom here. It says if you rebalance your portfolio by selling overweighted assets and buy underweighted one, uh, this author has a good idea a calculator to help you avoid selling assets when you contribute and avoid buying assets when you withdraw. So basically, you could limit your rebalancing efforts. To only those times when you're contributing or withdrawing from your portfolio. So that's the advantage. I've used this particular, um, this is an online spreadsheet. There's an address up here, optimalrebalancing.tk. Uh, I have used this in conjunction with my spreadsheet, my, uh, my uh, large spreadsheet, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, for many years. And it served me well. Every time I have, you know, 5,000 or 50,000 or any amount, and you want to make a contribution, it's nice to rebalance at the same time and to do it uh, at no cost. Okay, uh, now this is, uh, let's see if this, yeah, th this is actually taken from my spreadsheet. Uh, this is how I do a, an asset class uh, uh, creation. Basically, I, I uh, rather an allocation creation. Uh, basically, every all these asset classes here are each part is associated with a particular percentage of your entire portfolio. And I, I did this by starting with an 80-20 split over here under level one, and then I moved left and kept dividing. So basically, you're, this is still a top-down approach. Uh, just technically, this is right to left, and you'll find another spreadsheet within, or an example of a spreadsheet within this document that has a left or right approach using colored boxes. It's all good, but the, this is a very useful tool. Uh, to actually know what percentage you have and what your target asset allocation is. I decided that I was good with these eight asset classes. I uh, ended up dividing it up into large cap, uh, medium cap, small cap, international, international bonds, international stocks and international bonds, domestic bonds, which includes my certificates of deposit, uh, U.S. REITs, and emerging markets. And for the purposes of rebalancing, that's what I use. And so th that's that's what this does. That's what all this work is for. What's nice is somebody else has done the work so that you don't have to, if you don't want to, you modify these spreadsheets one time and you're ready to go. Uh, okay, now we're, we're, we're on the home stretch here. Now this particular uh, spreadsheet is the one that I've, uh, as I said, I wrote 17 years ago or so, 15 years ago or more, and then uh, released it in 2018, uh, a simplified version. And what it tries to do is I wanted, my goal was to create a, a place where I could manage my investments and actually enter in the data, the, the uh, values of those, of those particular funds and holdings that I had at the time. I had individual stocks at the time as well and see it tallied all in one place so I could 
No, I, I had a number of different accounts, which I still do, although I've uh, consolidated a little bit. So I wanted to know basically at the end of the year or the end of the quarter or whenever I felt like it, by entering these numbers, I wanted to know where I was as far as how much, what percentage of stock and bond and, and so forth. And I wanted it all in one place. So that's the uh, intent here. And following this is kind of the main tab where you enter in a data set to look at. And in this case, for this example, it's uh, June 30th, 2018. So the end of the second quarter. And below here are all the kind of cut off, but the sheet is basically the tab name. If you call it tab or sheet, same thing. Uh, the first one uh, is what you're looking at now. Selects the portfolio by a report number. So you can have five or, set, uh, five or six different dates at any given time. And you can say, well, how did I do compared to the end of uh, last year to the end of this year? How, you can make that comparison uh, visually. Uh, the second is the main tab where uh, all of it's put together for a particular date, asset allocation and the optimal rebalancing, which I've already talked about. So I'll, I, I have not displayed that here. Uh, and then at the time I had an employer, uh, employee retirement plan and uh, bank certificates of deposit. These are just data entry areas. So pages two and three on this on this particular spreadsheet are where you enter in uh, the, the data. Uh, by data, I mean you take your your statement your that your brokerage provides or your in, uh, your retirement plan provides, and you enter in the the numbers uh, for a particular date. So you'd like to end it on the first quarter, it'd be whatever March thirtieth, uh, June thirtieth. Uh, I forgot if there's if there's thirty one days in September. I've forgotten, uh, but in any event, uh, you can do it on any day. You notice here in a couple of the reports that I generated, I was apparently trying, I was up to trying to mark time or something because I, on number three here, it says eight one. And then I get another capture just six days later, seven days later. I don't know what that was all about. <laughs> uh, so another one of the tabs is uh, where you can enter in information for taxable. Uh, I say Vanguard here, but it could be any company. And I also include my Roth IRA account. And lastly, I have an investment policy statement. We'll step through a couple of these. Okay, so this is the, the main page. I actually should say a piece of the main page because this is in uh, portrait mode, I think, and it just doesn't fit on this, but you, I think you'll get the idea. This is this is the display page. You don't have to enter any numbers or uh, on this particular page. It displays the date when this portfolio uh, was captured. It breaks it out by large, mid cap, small cap, US stocks. And I have percentages here. At the time I had 53% of my portfolio in US stocks and 24% in international. And then I have a place for all stocks. It's a little more elaborate now than, than it was when I wrote this spreadsheet, but I've uh, uh, it gives you a nice, you know, just look at this one page and you'll have a picture of uh, your entire portfolio. And this is uh, one of the ent data entry level pages. Uh, here I am able to capture on this page, uh, my Vanguard Roth IRA account. There, are, I have other accounts that are, on, that are above this that you can't see. So I list the ticker symbol, the fund or ETF that is involved. I actually document their expense ratio and then it, the various dates, I probably started to say around here for the end of 2016. Uh, currently, it's being documented for uh, the second end of the second quarter in 2018 uh, for this for this demonstration. Those are never my account balances anyway, if anyone wants to know. I just tried to make them representative. Uh, and the spreadsheet does a lot for you. When you enter in the expense ratio here, it gives you, it looks at your entire uh, account and gives you a expense ratio that you're paying. So here, about 10 basis points, 9.5 basis points. Uh, that was not my average at the time, but that's what that's what's represented here. Uh, it also tells you uh, for each individual holding, what percentage of the account total. So emerging markets represents almost 9% of my Roth IRA account, according to this. And then there's other uh, places that you can enter things and get valuable information, such as if you have an annual fee that applies, an administrative fee or any assessment uh, for any of your accounts, you can enter that here. 
And this is for a particular, this is for the, this specific account. And it could be Fidelity or Schwab or any other account. And it doesn't have to be a Roth IRA. It could be something else. You can change this. Uh, near the bottom, it says um, IRA account enter percent AUM fee. So if you're paying Vanguard PIS, I think they charge 25 or 30 basis points. You'd enter in 0.30%. And if you have an assets under management fee of 1.25%, you're going to have to enter that there. That's 125 basis points. And why you would want to do that for all these different asset categories is because elsewhere in the spreadsheet, it will tally by dollars how much you're actually paying to maintain these uh, your investments. So especially if you have an AUM fee, which is assets under management, uh, definitely do utilize that because you may be surprised at uh, what you're paying on the year, how many hundreds or thousands you're paying, or tens of thousands if you have large balances. Uh, it can be uh, eye-opening. And then there's an area down uh, near the bottom of this particular sheet uh, where it displays the results of what's been on several pages here and all of your accounts entered. And it, just, it lists them for June 30th, 2018. Total Vanguard accounts here. You could just say total brokerage accounts you'd like you can change all this you can if you know anything at all about spreadsheets and you enjoy working on them you can enter in rows here um, that will you can put in all of your accounts specific i was just interested in all of my vanguard accounts so that's what that shows and then i have a 401k you could have 457 listed or you could have all of those retirement uh, sheltered accounts listed or summarized here and then any uh certificates of deposit, high yield savings, uh, that kind of thing. It's a separate sheet as well that you can enter in and all that will be summarized. And it'll give you a total of all of your investments. And by the way, how long does it take? I have a, a four accounts currently, or five, no four. I have four accounts and a total of, I think the number, last time I checked, it was 27 uh, mutual funds and ETFs. I do not have any individual stocks any longer. I have lots of uh, CDs and other types of high yield savings and so forth. And I'm, it takes, uh, including the time it takes me to download the statement, read through the statement and type in the numbers. It takes me about 15 minutes to enter in all of my numbers from all those accounts uh, and so forth. And I'll do that typically at the end of a quarter. Uh, so I just wanted to you know, this is a real time saver, this spreadsheet. Yes, it took me a long time to develop it, but once it's there, it's very handy. Okay. This uh, finally is a spreadsheet that was developed by uh, one of our members back a number of years ago for uh, a young couple that needed a a more general approach, uh, helpful, not only to maintain their investments, they needed a tool that would actually forecast for them and, and show them, give them a total picture of their financial situation. So um, our member's name was Bruce. Uh, he developed a spreadsheet that does this, and there's about seven different tabs. This is the spending plan or budget. Uh, this is just one tab. And these numbers here, which you could be entered, and you can, of course, insert rows, uh, monthly, annual, fixed, flexible, and all this feeds into other places on the spreadsheet. So this is kind of a nifty deal. Uh, this is uh, the tab or sheet that he calls income timeline. And here he captures quite a bit. You notice there's calendar years at the top. He actually made this a 20 year spreadsheet uh, because they're a fairly young couple. And he has two earners here. And, and he gives their ages. Well, I guess the ages are not very young, but uh, he has that uh, incremented. And the salary that they expect to earn or will earn, including possible social security payments, uh, IRA, I think he means RMD, MRD he wrote. Um, that comes from a different area in the spreadsheet. Second earner, same thing, salaries, social security, with or without COLA. Uh, he has rental income here listed. I can, hopefully you can all see this. Uh, and then he has a, a, a tab that very simply has the state and federal tax tables. And he actually just types those in. And 
this is the the result of those does all the calculations now what do you get after this what you do what what the result is a tax uh i'm sorry a cash flow sheet which can be very very helpful um he has uh, after tax cash flow desired after tax cash flow with assuming a 2.5 percent year over year increase uh and it shows the delta of those figures uh pay down mortgage information pay down credit card uh cumulative savings increases and decreases uh, then below here he has the investments and i believe he uses the four i believe you could just type over that number and you can decide what you want your investments to grow as and then um he has one for tax advantage he has a, a different he says plug-in but there's these are not technically these are not a spreadsheet plugins he actually has tabs where this information is uh, typed in he has a, a a line for tax free bonds for real estate appreciation mortgage debt etc and the net worth isn't that nice gives you a nice net worth there and uh we've had positive feedback on this but the last time he presented i think there were probably nine people in the room so uh, this is a tool that i think you should find pretty helpful um so what do we not cover today i think i mentioned at the beginning but next time uh, we'll talk about how to calculate your personal rate of return. A lot of people are interested in that, and I have uh, found a pretty straightforward way to do that. We'll evaluate uh, two or more different portfolios using Portfolio Visualizer. I think some of you are already familiar with that tool. Uh, then my probably my favorite tool of the bunch, the spreadsheet, uh, or I should say the table, the chart, that if you're a young accumulator can change change your whole life. Uh, how to reach financial independence with the Mr. Money Mustache chart, which is basically tracking contributions, uh, shows the uh, relationship between contributions and years left to retire. Uh, how to construct a safe withdrawal rate for retirement. I have some documents and presentations on that and how the markets work, a more general uh, approach there. So uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm all done here.